okay. Um, you me okay? My name is Sam Black from Ohio State University. I'll be chairing this afternoon's lecture session. It's my real pleasure to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Professor Parker Black. And Professor Black can receive her bachelor's degree from the University of Sydney in psychology and PhD by the Grand Prince from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, her PhD thesis was on the robot model of self-organization in insects and the production of species of the insect family. And she had lecture uh, steps from the University of Washington and stuff before returning to the University of Edinburgh. Uh, 
is part of the equation because that's the kind of habit that we just use, and also visual memory. So how do we know that they can that they use these different things? Well, we actually do field studies into the field and follow acts of energy to see what we're doing. This study um, was, was, was really led by my this track. We followed an ant around with different two GTS and a dummy time. Um, and we followed them from the first to the end of the next as they were from the track to track where they were going. And we actually did some tracking and I'll show you that in a moment. And then also modeled our scans at this point. So we could basically reconstruct what did the ant see when it was doing this kind of thing. Um, so this is what it looks like following that sound in the field. So we could basically control where they came in and how they marked the ants with different colors so that we knew which ant we were following. And then we just let it go where it wanted and we'd, we'd follow it around and see where it went. Um, this is the tracking system that um, and the Melissa built, which is really quite amazing. Um, so this is a moving time over this very noisy topic and we're managing to track this tiny ant as it moves around. And as I told you, most we can still reconstruct the human surface. And then we do, as I say, this sort of reconstruction of what this might look like from the ant's point of view. So I think we have to do low resolution visuals. So these are kind of the planets around it. Um, but they also see a lot of information from the sky because it's easier to follow this part. So this is the reconstruction of trunks that we do. Um, so this is actually what I've just showed you. This is the mess. These are the tracks that the ants took, and you can see um, they're going out to around. This was a kind of ten, eight to ten meter circle. And if they got that far, we gave them some food to see if they come back again. But you can see each of the ants is going in different directions, and sometimes we we take the ants on the list and this somewhere, and then if it's lost, they can go off in these very long things. But we can now reconstruct the entire tracks and the ground that they were moving on. Um, in really nice details. And to see here, for example, the different ants are taking different routes. As I said, they're not following the type of trail, so it's not because it's in the woods that it wants to take. Um, and we can even sort of look at what happens in the ground surface. Where is it going? Where is it going? Where is it going? Where is it going? So, what do we see when we look at these ants? Um, so, as I mentioned, we can see that they do plant integration and also that they do which I'm sure we will get to by the end of this talk. Um, so this mining method has come out with this for the very first time, and it's following this route, well, not really following it, searching for food. Um, and you can see by the thickness how spots are so fast. You can see it's kind of slow, um, looking for things. But as soon as it gets food, it comes straight up to the nest. And remember, these, these are bushes and things around it, so it's not taking the root off that it took. It can't see the nest, but it comes straight up to it. So this is the classic contribution. Um, and then when we let it go again, when it comes back out of the nest, sorry, I should have said the homing. So this is this is the outward part. This is the homing part that took number one. Then when it came out again, it didn't take the part it took before, but it came straight up to the food. So that's number two here. And then when it left from two again, it took the same route back to it. Okay? So that suggests that they, they both integrate their path and take us to the home, but also remember the outward factor to get back to the food. And if we then a bit mean and we take off the meat, from the dust, we put it back at the food. So this ant is now seeing the world twice, the route between its food and uh, the nest. What, what does it do? Well, what we find is that it searches around a little bit, but as soon as it finds the route that it's taken in these two times, it can follow that route again. If it goes off, it slows down, it starts to sit down, it finds the route again, and it speeds up, and so on. So it's actually, having seen this twice, it's able to find this route all the time. So, that's, that's this, these behaviors have been going on for a long time in, in Atlas. 
and other species of insect. Um, but one of the points has been that recording and manipulating insect neural circuits during navigational tasks is quite difficult to do. So what our approach has been is to ask what kind of insect patterns for navigation. So we can look for circuits that are known about any insect that might be able to support this behavior. And we have a few clues here. I'm assuming you are not be familiar with the insect thing. Maybe one or two. Um, so this is a high grain shown here. And as you can see, a lot of the processing is actually visual areas. So it's only the main and some of these visual areas. But there's these two parts here, which are called the mushroom bodies because they look a bit like mushrooms. Um, and people have known, and this is what they look like in, in more glorious detail in this nice picture. Um, and people have known for a long time that this is a couple of different things. So this visual memory can just be this is a good place to really see what that is. Um, and then there's another area here, which is kind of shown in orange up here, um, which is known as the central complex because it's in the center of this complex. Um, and this is what it looks like in the close up. And people have known that information about the direction, the heading direction here, goes into this area. So that suggests to me that's what you need. So essentially, the strategy has been to test models of these brain areas and to see if they can support navigational tasks when we actually go all the way through and put them in the robots. Okay, so let's say visual memory will support that. So um, this is just to kind of visualize what it's like to be a mutant. So we actually, here we've taken photos all the way along this route from the ants point of view. And then we kind of reconstruct what the world looks like. And as I said, they have low resolution vision. So we can see here just that the, um, this is what you get to see between your food and the nest. And you get to see that once or twice. And then you have to follow it. Again. And here we're talking about 10 meters, the size of an ant is less than a centimeter. So it's you going you know, from the one end of the bowl to the other. <laughs> And remembering the entire route, but without these buildings and signs and roads, it's just cross. Okay. So it really seems quite amazing that they can do this. So, one key idea that was actually very useful for trying to understand how to do this is to realize that they don't necessarily need to recognize at every moment exactly where they are, but rather um, that what they're doing is recognizing that things are familiar. So here's the, the basic idea is the ant is going home for the first time. Um, so it's following a particular route, and when it's following that route, it should take basically store snapshots as it goes along the route. So every few meters it should stop sorry, every few centimeters it should store that image. Okay. Um, and then if you now are trying to go along the route again, what you do is you um, you know, you, you stop, you look around, and you look for which direction looks familiar. And if it looks familiar in the direction you're going, then you keep going, and you keep going, you keep going, but then it takes up to the back of the you stop and look around, and you recognize. This is actually my top tip for anyone in a, in a foreign city. Um, like here, you know, the first thing you do when you go back of your hotel is you should turn around and look. <laughs> um, and I know this will dance, and it works really well, and it means that when you're coming back, you suddenly have to be curious to get the same street in the so that's the kind of idea. And if you do that, so note here, this is not, this is not actually going to be in order or anything. You just store all the images and you search through all the images in this algorithm. And what this creates is basically this is the, the root of the root. Um, this is the image difference on this axis. And this is the heading angle. So if you're heading in the same point as when you stop, you get this very small image difference. So you essentially put this value, you can just follow this value of similarity to get one. Okay? So this is really nice as a as a component. It was actually suggested to see this paper um, by Bart Bradley. And the question is, you know, could the brain of that actually implement such an algorithm? So as I've already hinted, we think it can, um, and we think that there must be way it's going to give you a kind of broad idea of this set of works. It looks a little complicated here, but it's actually a very good piece of We knew a lot about how this circuit works, um, actually, because of 
trying to do models of odor recognition. So this circuit gets odor information from the antenna lobe of the ant, and there's a set of neurons that are basically a pattern that represents the odor, and that gets projected into a higher dimension. Basically, it's an expansion into a larger number of cells here, um, and that pattern gets learned. Okay? Um, and so we just extended that as we, because we did it as a visual input. It's the same thing that any single visual input is just a pattern across a bunch of two neurons. It really just used the bit of the intensity differences because we didn't want to complicate things by making any assumptions about visual processing. Um, that creates a pattern, a, a visual pattern for the canyon cells, and then we actually just learn each of those patterns. Okay, so for example, here we have two output neurons, one of them is learning on your own phone. So, as if you see a pattern on your phone, you see it by changing the sound states. And similarly, um, if you're going out towards the food, so you have foraging motivation, then, and you see a pattern, then you should see. So just storing all of them one on top of the other, okay? But because they're sparse, um, they don't give you too much or come back to how much they might be about. So then, to when you see a new pattern, when you're trying to search, you can just simply take any new pattern, put it in through the human cells, and see what the output is. So this output will always tell you, are you going the right way and the things you can do that's the key idea. And this actually works very well. To, to do fraction. So it's a little bit testing it in the any little simulation. Um, so this is what we're storing in these kind of images along the route. Um, and we're able to find our way back to the house. Um, and just, just for comparison, um, we took one of the perfect memory, which was the original public book, and we just stored the images into the image comparison. And that mushroom body model. Um, and we looked at basically how many errors you were making as you went along the route, um, as a percentage of the yeah. So that seems to be one way around, but I don't know if it's going to be. Oh, yeah, no, that's what Kevin said. So, so here we just compare this to the scheme of reactions, so within 60 degrees of the rocket, can you make a lot of errors? Um, but you make very few errors with this perfect memory and the same mushroom memory. What you can see is you don't make errors if you're on the route, but also if you're near the route, you also get more or less the right direction. So you actually generate some stuff better. So, in obvious questions, you can know, use the memory capacity for just kind of storing each pattern as you go, um, which we kind of can make more formal as, for example, how many random things can be stored before the probability of a new pattern being incorrectly recognized exceeds 1%. Um, and one way to think about it is that because this is a sparse coding, each tiny cell, well, which is these, these sparse cells in the mushroom body, will only be active in one specific place, actually, puts it in a better place. So, um, and more abstractly, um, we're changing the weights of the connections, the patterns that match our patterns um, in one short episodic learning. So we're basically switching these synapses from one to low. In the original model, we actually did this with some kind of generic learning rule, but in fact, we realized we could, we, we tuned all the parameters in such a way that it was effectively one to um, And we realized once we made this abstraction into binary patterns and binary sciences, it was actually computationally identical to a wolf associated with that, if you remember, wolf from way back in the 1960s. Um, that's one reason why I'm here about it. And this abstraction is that solution that we make custom. And given the number of neurons in the muscle body, we actually figured out that you could store hundreds of views um, before you start to have any problem with with any of So it depends on how you know, the number of neurons and it depends on the sparsity, but the number if we go to what we know is correct for the insect, we can suddenly get into objects, which seems to be enough for these kinds of things. And it's also nice because having made this abstraction, it was quite efficient to control the tiny robot. So that's what we did. Um, so this is our robot ant. 
Um, and we're using panoramic scene memory because in effects, we usually have to have panoramic vision. Um, and you might, if you look closely, see that this is actually the mobile phone of the beers that I'm using as a robot. Um, so we just stuck a panoramic lens with the camera of the phone, and then we have this low resolution image, and we just are storing those images and then using it to make a decision about whether to keep going and whether to start looking at the objective. And that seemed to work, so we took it back to the project and we were able to get to work the next one. So it's not as the robots aren't as good as going over rough ground as the last one, but it's quite fun. Even with the wind, I think it makes it fun. Okay, let me just check the time. Okay, so I'm now going to switch to path integration. And again, I'm going to kind of go through it by saying, well, what's the problem? What's the kind of algorithmic solution? And then what's how might that be in the current day? So, path integration is, in one sense, very simple. All you need to do is to go to the city, and that means you can maintain an you know, estimate of how where you are relative to your starting location. Um, and if you start the equations, you can do to do the updating. Um, but as was discussed in this very nice paper um, from um, Vicky Sophie Cho, it's not obvious immediately which um, reference frame or coordinate system you should use to do this. People just have certain kinds of assumed, well, they must be doing this in ecosystem polar coordinates, so that they have always those, you know, plus minus plus two and plus minus to one to get them. Um, but there are alternatives, so here, so maybe you can have coordinates on the sort of centered on your own, um, or you can have coordinates that are kind of geocentric coordinates, XY coordinates centered on home, or you can have polar coordinates centered on home, or you can have Cartesian uh, coordinates centered on your own location, or polar coordinates centered on your own location. So this would be saying you know this will be saying relative to home, you actually know what it's one position in geocentric terms. And what this paper did was to point out that even though each of these is, is possible and you have us an update a quite simple update equation that you need to do to keep track, and some of them have a few problems as a practical system to use. So for the polar coordinates, there's this issue that if you um, as you get closer and closer to home, then the rate of change that you need to make for your direction is that goes towards infinity. So you actually, if you cross over the home place, you actually can't go through with this thing where you have an infinite change of the direction, which is not ideal for a system to keep track of things. Um, similarly, um, if you do the egocentric Cartesian, then what you can imagine is if you're turning on the spot, then your x y coordinates with x coordinates get bigger, you might have x naught as you turn, and vice versa, if you want to change whether it's even if you stay in exactly the same position relative to where you just split with it, you're changing your coordinates with it. So that's the same idea of that. And in fact, for both the egocentric types of coordinates and both the polar types of coordinates, you actually need to know your target to set to do the right. So you can see um, in the equations that they actually require knowledge of your own objective state. Whereas this one doesn't. It just needs to know how much have I rotated at this moment, how much have I moved at this moment, and then you can update. That gives you your update. So they suggested in this paper that geocentric Cartesian is, is the best option for um, that's trying to do this, um, and that you need to. The only problem with this is to transform that something into this information. So, um, and there was actually a hypothetical neural circuit suggested um, quite some years ago for how maybe with neurons you could do a uh, geocentric Cartesian encoding, in this case, a redundant geocentric Cartesian encoding. So, if it were to stay there, and this is the whole thing so Imagine you had a set of cells that respond when the animal is facing in different compass directions. And we know that infants can actually use the sky as a compass, both the sun position as a compass, right? 
And this is an absolute compass, which is very useful for you. So if you have neurons that respond when you're facing a particular compass direction, um, you can basically translate each of the vectors of motion into a kind of sine wave of activity across that set of neurons. So basically, this is the, the new index right here. Um, this is your little bit of motion. Then you can basically say, well, let's have the, the phase of the sine wave correspond to the angle, and the amplitude of the sine wave correspond to the angle. And then similarly, if you're doing this little bit of motion, then the phase, again, is here, and the amplitude is the length of the vector is the amplitude. Okay. Um, so this each time it represents you each of these new pieces. So if you accumulate this, so you basically add these two together, you get two sine waves, same frequency, you get a sine wave out. And that sine wave corresponds exactly to the vector sine. Okay, so it's the um, the phase is the vector, the angle is the vector sine, and the amplitude is the length of the vector sine. So this is a very neat way to basically do um, vector addition. Okay. So basically, okay, accumulating this activity corresponds to the vector sum. Then the basic set what one way to, to drive to use this to conclude is if you have this vector sum, you can compare this to your current heading and by shifting back and forth to sign the shift to the shift. But it's also nice because even though it's a set, it is actually very, very redundant in the case of encoding. It's like you're encoding how far you've gone in each of these directions. Um, it's also very easy to read off the polar information from this. So you can look for what, which is the least active um, neuron that's at an angle, and what is the amplitude difference between the most active and least active. That's the length of the vector. So we were very interested in how the direction could actually be happening in the brain of the animal. And this is the central complex. This is beautiful tracing of the neural circuitry. It's been done by Stanley Heinze, who has been collaborating with for a while. And the work I'm about to describe was mostly done by the PhD student at Houston. Um, and this might look like spaghetti, which okay, probably makes sense of something like this. But it turns out there's a lot of really clear and interesting stuff in this So the reason why we thought this might be the theory of, of path integration is that um, Stanley had identified neurons in this circuit that seem to get the right input. So they get input from about the compass and they get input about forward speed in the form of optic flow. So specifically, um, if you describe it as a set, this is the transition between the sun, to the sun. If you rotate the polarizer, polarizing filter above the angle of the recording from these neurons, um, you would see this response. That in which direction the polarization was, we get this increase in power and decrease in power. And it turned out that across this um, area here, which is called the previous rear view bridge, um, you got this regular thing that the preferred direction made this regular pattern. So it gave me each column of this neural structure had a different preference, and that has its challenge to speak towards. And then if you Simulate to the spider. So, so you show the optic flow, you know, this classic star models thing of things flowing past you like this, and the flow like this, rotating around you, and, and you call from, from neurons in the input here. Um, what Sandy found was that there are some things that go back to this to back simulated side to back optic flow, and they don't respond to back to front, they don't respond to the pressure pressure. And they can respond uh, with a firing rate that basically corresponds very well to the simulated burst. So we really need to be comfortable with So this is quite hard to understand in terms of these like, lovely neural pictures. So we can make it a little bit um, simpler by, by drawing it as a kind of more concrete diagram. But I want to stress that in the pictures that I'm going to show you, even though this looks like in the Palestinian model, these connections are connections that are actually found in the insect. So we know that these neurons connect to each other. Okay? Um, and it's, they're not big sets of neurons. These are actually the number of neurons. When I have eight neurons here, I mean there's eight neurons. Okay? Um, and 
these are the blood stem cells that I just told you about that respond when the animal is has a sudden infection, but it's not an infection. And I said there's these other these sets of cells that get recruited um, from the, the direction cells and the cells from the SDM. Okay, so we call these the memory cells, and we assume that what they're doing is integrating this input relative to the activity of these cells. So, basically, for a motion vector, each memory cell gets the current speed of the motivated by the perceptive direction in this one, which looks a bit like this. Okay, so this is the, the direction that it's going that gets inhibited the most, and then the speed input basically determines. And if it goes in another direction, it gets a different input. And if it does continue to integrate, it will still get the same current vector sum. So, obviously, you've seen these pictures before. And it seems that the sick literally implements this completely hypothetical output of the host. As I say, more than 25 years ago. So, that's how we think that the integration is working. Um, and then we want to use this to steer clear. So, the path integration that I just described to you, especially as I said, C, which is very this is the activation of each column, each of these columns, um, which basically all together make a distributed encoding of the home vector. And for different home vectors, we have a different distributed encoding. So, what we want to do is, is compare this estimate of where we want to go. And we have this set of cells here, which are called the steering cells, um, which also get input from the compass heading, and they also and they get input from the memory. So they, they're in a good position to compare them, but they have this funny cross pattern of connections you can see here. Um, and we know that these these cells are taken. Two areas of being separated that we've got in steering. So they're, they're what we need to do this sort of thing. So, how could they do this? Um, yeah, so, it's trying to say that these cells are inhibited by the direction cells, excited by the memory cells, with this regular activity of the So, to try and understand what was happening here, we actually use the force graphs. I don't know if people are familiar with the force graph. This is when you have a set of things that are connected in a list of connections and you try and do it in picture. Which shows the shortest possible paths between the points. Those things, and um, people use it for social networks and things like that. So, we wanted to visualize this actual function topology, and this is what came up. Um, and this literally fell in front of us. It's really fantastic. Um, and as I said before, this is a map. This looks you know, like it's a beautiful artificial model, but it's actually neurophysical. And you're able to put in these conditions. Um, so, what this does is we have the ring of the spy compass, as we said before, um, which is going to these cells that are the memory. And we have these kind of two copies of the memory one shifted to the left and one shifted to the right. And that then gets in these steering cells. So, imagine, for example, if that cell has mostly gone north. And so these memory cells here are the ones that are charged up the most because you've been going north. Then, if you're currently going, you know, northeast, then this cell will be inhibited, and this one will be activated. This one will be less activated, so this will be less inhibited because you're not going in this direction; you're going in this direction. But it will be equally activated by the memory. So that basically tells you you should. If, you're, if this is what your current thing is, you should turn the next if you want to match the memory, okay, and vice versa. And this happens all the way around the ring, and you just take the sum of the inputs and outputs, and it's serious with that. So let me just show you that in another way, which is giving you some, some people who find this a bit intuitive. So as I said, you have this population code of your memory, um, and what you do is that you shift Shifted clockwise, anti clockwise, and then compared to the compass. And the compass neurons are inhibitory, so you have to subtract this from this, so subtract this from this, and this from this, and see what you get. And 
and you sum up each of those, and you get a configuration. You should turn up, you should turn up which one is the most over. So, obviously, you put this into a similar to B, so this kind of throws it into the direction. Um, so, you can kind of see that the direction that B is going is shown in this in, in a ring, and then because it's going gradually more and more in this direction, that builds up in the memory here. And that means when you want to go home, you can compare the previous comparison in this algorithm. So, at the moment, it's just going to put and be switch on the steering. And we also get an emergent search for the data that is basically what the search is trying to do is to have all the activity in the memory ring be equal. So we keep steering until it's equal and you can go to shoot and track the data and that brings you back again so you actually get a search for the search. That's it. Okay, and um, in the insect robotics lab, I think I've got this on the robot as well, so we actually put this on the spine robot, and this was from the young sentiments. Um, so this robot has a downward facing camera that's getting the flow information, and then it has a computer that's literally got this neural circuit. And as I told you before, the neural circuit really consists of less than 100 units, actually less than 50 units. It's very hard work to work on, on a robot. And here we're using a standard magnetic compass, but we're actually building a horizontal compass as well. So, this is testing out in the field in, in Scotland. There was lots of wind, um, so it gave us lots of disturbances and stuff. So, it's going back in this kind of zigzag path. And then, coming home again. And we record you know, when it picks sets its home. Um, and we look at the error that the distance from. And this is what it looks like. Um, and the key thing here is the actual review dots of what we got from these real unfold tests. And we found that the error was increasing at less than one meter. That means we just really fine with wind and disturbances and everything else. So we think that's pretty good. Um, and these other dots show lots of dynamic situations, similar features as we did to see if you can over money and to make this object flow estimation But we still get pretty decent results. Okay. So I've got a few minutes, I think. So, um, yeah. Um, I'll talk very briefly about two things. Um, so one is the vector memory. So I said when the ant comes home the first time, it doesn't then go out searching manually, it goes straight back to the food. Okay. So it actually has remembered, remembered where the food was, so I can use that. So we actually realized we could expand this model that I just showed you in a very simple way to do the vector memory. So basically, all you need to do is when you get to the food location, is you store this current path integration set. So this what is the, the activity of your memory neurons at that point in time. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the vector memory. And then you, then you go home, as usual. And going home means you're trying to get the path integration to equal zero, and these many things to equal zero. Um, so when you get back to the next, to get back to the food again, what you can do is inhibit um, your steering cells with this memory that you stored. And what that means is your, your whole circuit, you don't have to change anything else about the circuit. The circuits now can try and make the difference between your path integration and the vector memory be zero. So it means it's going to drive you back to where the food is. Okay, and you can basically, for multiple food locations, you could have one neuron that has synapses that have stored these values that you need to get back. Um, so let me just show you that in illustration of the same idea. Um, so you've gone out from home. When you're at the food, you store this And then when you're trying to go back to the food, you do this inhibition. It's not like you're actually doing what you're imagining and you're in the opposite direction. So that's the inhibition. And you try to go home again until you get these two things in balance. So this is kind of what you're imagining you're doing. But because you're actually starting from home, you can actually do this process back to the 
And one nice thing about this is that if you get to the food division, you find there's no food there. Okay, you can just take away the division of the health integration will be correct and you can go home again. Or, alternatively, while you're at this food, you can remove this inhibition and say, well, if she can remember something, she's got food. So I'm going to now put that as my inhibition. So now I'm at the food, I'm imagining I'm down here because that's the sum of my two, the difference of my two, my concentration and my vector point. And then again, I'm trying to go in the direction of I'm trying to zero this bit. So that's that class, which, given that I'm actually starting at the food, means I take this one, otherwise, in other words, I take the direct shortcut at the food. So, that tiny addition to the circle means we have a jagged circle and vector manipulation and vector addition and vector rotation. And in fact, this is something where it sounds good, but now we think you can basically anything you can do with vectors is circle, which is quite exciting. And obviously we've seen that to show this as well. Okay, and then the final thing I've got to talk about is question that seems obvious is well, I've told you about the view memory, I've told you about the vectors, do they do they interact? Um, and one case in which they so we do know that you didn't try to at least that you're using the vector information the first time you're learning the views. It's because you have you know how to get on with your vector and then you store the views. Um, I'm not going to talk about the second one, but there's evidence of these two if you, have two, if you put them in conflict, then you actually combine them in a weighted average. Um, but there also seems to be direction of information transfer. So how we can to understand this was looking at this. Um, that we're going backwards. So this is a plant that's killed a poor cricket and is trying to take it into the nest. Um, and you might notice it's gone backwards. Um, so how is it doing the view match? I think it's going backwards. Um, indeed, how is it following its vector? Well, we can imagine how it can follow its vector because that really just needs a 180 degree flip, which is so can do. But how is it? It's also able to use its view memory in this situation. So we did an experiment with backwards ants. <laughs> um, and so I'll try and describe this briefly. Um, so the, the ants were trained to the nest, one around here, they've got food here, and then they had to come home this way. So what they learned to do, for example, was um, what we did was to pick them up here when their vector would tell them they should go this way to go to the nest. And then we put them here where their food, where, where what they recognize we have landmarks around here, so when they hit with their water lines would be to go this way. So basically we've got a competition between this is what our vector says, this is what the view says. Okay. And we found that indeed if they were going forwards, they would follow the familiar view, and if they were going backwards, they would follow the vector. But nicely, um, what we found was some ants that actually dropped their food, took a peek to match the view, and then updated their vector. So this is what it looks like for compass. So this ant is going in the vector direction upwards. Has a quick look around. And then goes in the direction. So sorry, this wasn't just a quick we did in the end that they did. And indeed, we found that if they looked forward um, during the peak, then when they went backwards afterwards, they would go in the correct direction when they were going the whole direction. Okay, so to get to our conclusions. Um, what I'm trying to show you is how we are trying to connect insect navigation field studies to neural mechanisms. And as I said, it's difficult to do this kind of learning in, in the field or um, to manipulation of these circuits. But by measuring the circuits, we can find the link between the two. And we can demonstrate at least the plausibility of this analysis which is implemented by the insect brain. Also, I think we really gain some insight into the circuit function. What I think is the most amazing about this is that these bits of the insect brain that I've just been telling you about are very similar in every type of insect. 
And if you imagine, if you think of insects as a whole, they have completely different body plans, different body styles, different coloration regions, everything else. But nevertheless, they all seem to be the same circuits. So I think these are two really useful general purpose circuits. Um, so the mushroom body architecture acts as a general purpose multimodal associated unit, which animals can just extend by feeding the sensory inputs into it. Um, and then this central conscious architecture. This is a general sense of, well, not just the state of the body, but the body, but the indeed to do any kind of vector transformation to the care to them. Um, and then finally, I think robotics is the same thing if I look at these models under various definitions. So let me just thank the people involved, um, Mike Langdon, who got me into that work initially as a PhD student and then as a postdoc, and to be to do this. Really key in doing all of the behavioral experiments. Just us who did the analysis of the view memory uh, capacity, Benjamin who did the tracking of the ants, and Sebastian who was in charge of the backwards case study, and also a number of other former students and postdocs who were involved in work and the collaborators. Um, and I'm going to just a little bit of these ants. I'm, I'm just being carried along by all these people. There's someone who can do it. Okay, so we tried to say this at the beginning, but this is not emphatic here. <laughs> These ants do not need chemical carriers, they do not all follow the same route. Um, basically, they're desert ants, the chemicals would burn off immediately and they have to go really fast to the chemical trail following the ants. And in fact, a lot of species of ants that do use chemical trails learn visually what they see if they're following the same track. And then if you put in competition, the visual cues and the chemical trail, they'll follow the visual cues once they've been So, so it's actually, everyone always thinks of chemical trails, but, but that's not, you know, they can use them as structuring, but that doesn't mean they can use things like that. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's very fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what I mean, so when we, when we simulate it as a spiking network to try and be you know, very realistic, then we can run it in real time. So, since then, we've done some work with um, neuromorphic hardware to try and make it go fast. But if you abstract it as this kind of binary uh, encoding, it's, it's plenty faster. You can do it in real time. I'll show you the robot and show you the That is real time. The, the trail in the outdoors was sped up because otherwise it just takes too long, but it's basically got this fast. So, if you went to the one that is in the same way, the position is not good. Yeah, so. 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 The next day, they remember that route, and then if you know, they found a new location, so they'll go there, and then some the next time to be there, but to go back to the first one, they still want to go to the next So it seems like it's, it's quite common in that sense. Yes, but they can, they can look like, this is a human condition, so one way you do that is you dig a little pit on their route, so they can find this pit, and it doesn't potentially start to be spotted to learn that that would be the first thing that would be as well. So they can often be the same in that sense. Yeah, 
insects. So we don't we mostly work on individual insects and group swarms, but this one the bacteria look fine at this time. And so they're all using the nesters that are all using the same eggs that you know from the reference. And um, so if you really with bees, bees and hooks to actually be able to tell each other this factor. So the bee dance that they do at the time is one bee has a memory, a vector memory, and it's telling the other bee, this is where the food is, this is where it's and they're just that's the food. So in that sense, it can transfer this way. Um, so that's that's one way to do it. You don't really get to do it in a bigger collective so far. We, we think individual insects are amazing to us. So, my question is, you mentioned the kinds of like stuff that's going on in the You also mentioned the big memories and lots of fun things. I guess during death, it's got a whole rhythm of these different situations. What kind of mechanism do you think is that I've been using? Yeah, to deal with that. Yeah, so there's two hypotheses in case of moments. So, one is that they actually have some kind of internal clock and that they're able to update. Um, their vector memory according to that internal clock. So there's some evidence from bees that they that they actually take the doing that. The other very recent discovery is that it needs a certain energy compass. And so what they might be doing is calibrating the sky compass to the magnetic compass because the sky compass is more for your to learn that. But the magnetic compass obviously is more you know for hearing during the day. So I think maybe each time they come up they just do a little calibration and then and then they use it as Yeah, so I mean it's important to note that, that insect brains and, and vertebrate brains evolved completely independently in that they can't access the top of the brain. So it's not that they you know the same but it's possible they've been converted to evolution, which is obviously very interesting. So currently um we're we're kind of thinking that these as I said, Canadian cells have activity that is a bit like their cells. Um, or at least, and actually, when you start to look closely at what place cells do, they're not really place cells. So, um, we can have a longer discussion about that. Um, in terms of the grid cell system and, and the spectral system, those seem to be different systems, so as far as we can tell at the moment. But, but there's, a, there's certain ways you can look at them where you can start to say, well, maybe they are not similar. But we haven't found it any kind of direct at this point. But very interestingly, this, um, this kind of compass. This organized interaction thing. So that's very like the interaction cells, and it's also completely but just found that there's actual continuity in the in the physical structure.